All right, guys, today we're going to talk about Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Napoleon was born on the island of Corsica, which prior to his birth had just given up their rights to France in the Treaty of Versailles. Not the one from World War I. There's like eight of them. His father was of Tuscan noble descent. In other words, they were Italian. Since prior to the country giving up its rights, they were ruled by Italy. But despite being of this nobility, their status was minor. And they didn't really have much luxury to show for, at least as much as you would think, from a noble. The political figure of Paoli formed a group against the French when they tried to take over. This group included Napoleon's father. Unfortunately, this resistance fell flat. Paoli was forced into exile and Napoleon's father decided to cut his losses and place his alliance with the French instead. Not two-faced at all. The alignment, however, did have its merits as it allowed Napoleon's father to land his son a spot in one of France's colleges. This was the military college of Brienne where he studied for five years before going off to an academy. It was in that last year when Napoleon's father died from stomach cancer, leaving Napoleon and his family in distress and their back against the wall. Nonetheless, he was still able to graduate and then he became the second lieutenant of the artillery in the French army. After a while, he left the army and headed back home. Around this time, the French Revolutionary War was starting to bubble and it was only a matter of time before things got worse. Napoleon knew that a change was necessary, but he didn't quite know how to approach the situation. He goes back to his roots. He makes an attempt to side with his father's former ally, Paoli, to go against the French occupation. Paoli, however, had no interest in this man after his father basically left him high and dry. How do I know that you're not gonna do the same thing? I'ma need you to move around and don't let the door hit you on the way out. Arriving back to France, Napoleon rejoins the artillery unit of the army. With all the confusion going on, this made a lot of room for people like Napoleon to come up. He quickly allies himself with the far left political party, the Jacobin Club. Like Paoli, this group was also looking to establish a constitutional monarchy, which would allow for more power amongst the people. There were a lot of things going on at the time, but for the most part, the government was only giving power to the people with wealth. The Jacobins were basically out here telling people, hey, you don't have to take their shit. Just saying, just saying. And to be honest, at first, the Jacobins were down with the government, all the way up until the point where they found out that King Louis XVI would keep his position under this new system. If this were to happen, it would all be for nothing. Nothing would change. This pretty much formed the basis of a lot of the civil friction that was going on. Jumping in on this route, Napoleon immediately became president and heightened his social status through debates and speeches among the other politicians. Months later, Paoli became commander in chief of the French army which ultimately brought about more problems for Napoleon. Before Paoli took on this position, Napoleon went back home to handle some business. Since Napoleon was gone for such a long time, a couple of months, he was reported by Paoli as a deserter and the two of them fell out once again. Lucky for him, France had just declared war on Austria that same year. So they said, you know what? I know we called you a deserter at first, but it's not that big of a deal. We're gonna look the other way. We need you on the field quick, fast, and in a hurry. Napoleon not only rejoins the army, but somehow shimmies his way past his old position all the way up to the spot of a captain. The Jacobins didn't agree with the way that Paoli was using his power. And since Napoleon aligned himself with this party, when a civil war broke out between the group and France, Napoleon took the fall with the Jacobins and the entire Bonaparte family had to flee to France. Eventually, the Jacobins were successful, 
the old government was overthrown and the new national convention got rid of the former monarchy and replaced it with a republic. The majority of the officers that were in the French army were nobles, but when the old government was overthrown, their status went to dust. In response, more than 90% of these officers fled France, making room for new people to step their foot in. This is where Napoleon comes in. In the siege of Toulon, the commander of the French artillery was wounded, and in his place stood Napoleon, locked, loaded, and ready for action. He knew that if he could capture a good vantage point, they could force out the British ships that were called in against him. In his efforts, he was indeed able to push out the Brits, and although he was injured in the thigh, Napoleon was promoted to Brigadier General right away. At this point, the new French government, the Directory, started to take notice of Napoleon and his work. When he pulled the same thing off in the Battle of Vendemiaire, the Directory said, that's it. This dude is top of the line. Get this man a promotion expeditiously. They made him commander of the Army of Italy and their closest advisor when it comes to military pursuits. Now, before he took on this position, he found his first wife. However, she wasn't able to produce an heir for Napoleon, so she was deemed practically useless. So he kicked that bitch to the curb, got a new girl, wifed her up, and had a family with her shortly after. And he did hook up his first wife with a little something for her troubles, all right? Class act, guys, he's a class act. When Napoleon finally took lead of the army, he managed to do a complete 180 from what it once was. With his help, they were able to win several battles against Austria, expanded the French Empire, and they were able to quiet down some of the civil conflict by royalists who wanted France back as a monarchy. Now, when the French Revolution first kicked off, France's allies were like, it's a civil problem. Happens all the time, they'll hash things out. But once they realized that King Louis XVI's life was in actual jeopardy, Austria and Prussia said, okay, it seems to me that you guys want these problems. So let's get it. Once these regions got in on the mix, all the other regions got in on the mix, and now all of a sudden, everybody in their mama is at France's neck. Napoleon pulls up to Austria like, you must not know who I am. No, we don't. Remind us, who are you? So Napoleon runs through their forces. Again, again, and again. This man even led a bayonet charge straight through Austria's rear guard. You know what that means? That means this dude ran straight into their people like fuck it. Fuck how it turns out. He takes out Russia, he took over a good portion of their lands like Belgium and Lombardy and set his sights on his next victim, Great Britain. Now that Napoleon was gassed up, he felt like that he could take on the Brits and he was met with the reality check extremely fast. He was saucy, but not that saucy yet. So he decided, let me take an indirect approach. He goes to Egypt and attempts to disrupt Britain's trade with India and North Africa. Now, he had a couple of wins out there under his belt, but when he lost, he lost. In the Battle of the Nile, most of the people that didn't die were either wounded or passed away from the bubonic plague. British Admiral Nelson gave this man the beatdown, taking out most of his ships and leaving him little to work with. So you know what he does? Napoleon leaves his army there. This is why I respect this man. He knows he ain't shit, but he owns it. Integrity for who? For what? He leaves the little that's left of his army, who was later safely returned, so it's all good there. He then goes back to France and overthrows the same people that gave him power in the first place. He left his army abandoning his own position and goes back to France to overthrow his own government. 
And the crazy part about it is he pulled it off. He took part in the coup of Brumaire and successfully became the first member of the new government, the consulate. And with no one else to go against him in terms of power, he practically became the ruler of France. What a shake back. He then uses this power to rewrite the French constitution, making himself consul for life and eventually the first emperor of France altogether. Now that the country was under Napoleon's rule, instead of laws, it had to follow a code instead, the Napoleonic Code. This was freedom of religion, formally abolishing service, and free school for everybody. And even up until today, you can see a lot of nations still use a format of this exact same code in the way that they organize their people. He reformed education, he improved transportation, and he also helped establish the Bank of France. But as a war vet, Napoleon couldn't get war off of his mind. His tamperings angered Britain to the point where Britain, Russia, and Austria formed a coalition against him. He can't stop us all. This was the Napoleonic Wars, and in turn, Napoleon had to give up France's land in the Louisiana Purchase for 15 million just so he could fund these campaigns. Some of the campaigns were successful and as a result, they ended up doing the Treaty of Tilsit, declaring that France was now allies with Russia and Prussia. He continued to extend his power through the continental blockade where he was stopping the Brits from entering the continent for trade. The positioning that Napoleon needed to enforce this blockade required him and his people to fall off into Portugal and Spain. But both of these nations were like, nah, we're not having it. Slow your roll, pimpin. You can keep that foolery that you got going on over there. The countries then link up with Britain and go at Napoleon together in the Peninsula War. As I mentioned before, Russia was one of France's allies at the time, and they were also in on this blockade. But the problem with them being in on the blockade was that in order to help France, they were basically shooting their own country in the foot, putting their relationship in a strain the entire time. Until one day, Napoleon said, screw it, we're invading Russia. Wait, aren't those our allies? Motherfucker, I said we're invading Russia. Now, at the time, Napoleon was leading Le Grand Army, which was an army of 600,000 men. Russia didn't want the smoke with none of that. So they ran and started to hit them with the scorched earth tactics. Now Napoleon and his people are out here starving in the freezing cold and getting ambushed. He went from 600,000 men to 100,000. Now it's got the other nations thinking, oh, this dude isn't so tough after all. Now it's Napoleon versus everybody. Everybody is at this dude's neck. Russia, Spain, Portugal, Britain, Sweden. The coalition finished off what Napoleon had left. At this point, they lost majority of their belief in this man. France forced Napoleon to give up his position, and then they exiled him to the island of Elba. But Napoleon said, I got something for him. Mama ain't raised no quitter. This dude escapes the island, goes all the way back to France, and resumes his role as the emperor. Napoleon? I thought you were banished to the island of Elba. Yeah, they tried to get rid of me, but you know how that goes. Look, King Louis, I appreciate you keeping the seat warm for me, but I'll be taking that over from here. You'll do no such thing. Oh, really? Now, keep in mind that a lot of people in France still view Napoleon as a hero. So if Napoleon said that King Louis is finished, King Louis is finished. Once he takes back his position, Napoleon immediately hits the field and tries his luck at taking over Belgium. He fails miserably and not only did he lose but he also lost his position 
for the second time and was banished once again to another island, the island of Helena. But this time, he didn't make it out because this island is on the other side of the world. Good game. GG's my guy, GG's. And this was pretty much the end of his reign. His health finally started to catch up with him and he speculated to have died from stomach cancer at the age of 51. Let me know what you guys think. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Follow me on Twitter for updates on the channel and I will be back with more tight moon content. It is your boy Sire. I'm out.